Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here sharing some time with you. Um, sorry that this time I could not be physically present at the conference, but I will do my best to share with you a number of reflections regarding our activity and our industry of science and technology parks in the world through this video uh, presentation. I guess that one question that we could and perhaps should ask ourselves is how old, or rather how new, science and technology parks and areas of innovation are. Because as we all know, this concept uh, started some 50 years ago, more or less, and many things have happened since then. The evolution of the concept of science and technology park has been staggering, I dare say. We have seen many new models uh, emerge, many new formulas and solutions being proposed, some of which have proven to be successful, others perhaps less so. So I think it is important to perhaps uh, give us some time uh, to reflect upon uh, this uh, situation. Uh, we are witnessing now uh, a very important evolution of our concept, at least this is our perception from the point of view of the International Association of Science Parks and Areas of Innovation, of which I am the Director General, as you probably know. And I will try to share with you a number of ideas regarding this particular point of where are parks marching towards uh, right now. We know that science and technology parks are an answer to a set of new needs and of new conditions and circumstances. The uh, advent of the knowledge economy has changed so many things. It has changed uh, the type of markets which have become all of the sudden global and that is not a minor change as we all know. Uh, it has changed the main pillars of our economy which is now founded on the intangible and of knowledge more than on physical assets. It has created a new type of company, the so-called knowledge, uh, knowledge economy company. It has even created a new type of, of workers, the knowledge economy workers, or the creative class, as it is often referred to. In one word, many uh, new things that we were not familiar with a few decades ago. And of course, this implied uh, a number of new problems, a number of new challenges, and uh, it required a number of new solutions. Science parks, technology parks, are the answer to uh, the new needs in terms of location. In which spaces could and should these new companies locate so as to have better conditions to carry out their work, to become more competitive, to be more attractive, to present a better image of themselves to be able to develop new mechanisms of interaction between them, of interaction with universities and academia and research institutions, in order to make sure that a constant flow of technology and knowledge could be carried from these uh, knowledge creation institutions towards the companies that are the ones receiving and applying this new knowledge and technology. Parks appear to give an answer to these new challenges and that's why as a concept of a space they are radically different from what we used to know uh, before, the traditional real estate areas. Uh, yes, parks have a real estate base. I'm not here to minimize or to be disdainful towards the real estate element, but as we have said over and over again, the real estate component of parks, it is not the soul of science or technology park. It is not what defines a park. And uh, I, I think that we all acknowledge now how successful this concept has been. It has been implanted practically in all places, which is significant because at the beginning, a number of years ago, uh, one could think that only uh, highly developed areas from the technology and economic point of view could have 
the elements and the ingredients that are necessary to have a successful science park. But fortunately, the concept has proven to be uh, proteic and very rich and able to generate its own models and submodels. So now we have a vast uh, spectrum, a vast range of models that can be of application in highly developed areas, but also in areas that are much less, much, much less developed. Perhaps one of the aspects that is more uh, important in order to understand what is the evolution of science and technology parks today has to do with a city. City as a place that is no longer uh, a passive container where things happen, as I said before. A city is becoming more and more an active player. Cities want to uh, implement programs and, uh, and create mechanisms and facilities that will ensure uh, the uh, presence uh, of newer businesses and of knowledge-based economic activity. And there are a number of strategies to cope with that. And the key message that I would like to pass on to you today is that this is absolutely crucial for the future of science and technology parks. And it has very much to do also with another a concept that we call areas of innovation. And I, I have to acknowledge to you all that this is, for the time being, a provisional name. We may later on find a better expression to define this concept or not, or maybe we will decide to stay with it. I will be uh, perhaps making a few uh, more in-depth comments about the areas of innovation later on the presentation, but I just wanted to pinpoint the fact that how parks relate and will relate in the future with the city is uh, very important to ensure that the concept of science and technology park will remain relevant and pertinent in the future. We at the IASP have developed a methodology that we call Strategigram, which helps us to analyze and identify and compare the different strategic models that technology parks and science parks use uh, all throughout the world. And one of the axes that we use in this Strategigram methodology is what we call location. And there we have to check whether parks have uh, made the decision of uh, locating in cities or outside cities. So the strategic choices here would be whether a park is an urban park or a non-urban park. However, the uh, important issue to realize is that this nature of being urban or non-urban is not only depending on geographical criteria, it's not only depending on whether a park is physically inside a city or outside a city, closer or farther away. There are other elements to be taken into consideration, uh, such as the presence of residential areas, uh, the facilities to carry out cultural activities or leisure activities and, and the like. So, in fact, what we try to measure uh, at the strategigram uh, in this particular axis is what we call the urban density of a science park, which is, again, not entirely depending only on the physical location. Location is a factor that has a lot to do, almost everything to do, with what we are dealing with uh, today in this presentation. Uh, the first axis of the strategigram tool that I mentioned has to do with location. So, we start from the assumption that parks, strategically speaking, have to make a very important choice, either to be urban or to be non-urban. This would be the urban extreme of the axis, this would be the non-urban extreme of the axis, this would be the zero point or point of balance where parks that are semi-urban would be located in this axis. 
There is a very famous uh, American TV series called Sex in the City. I guess we can use that title for this axis. Parks in the city. Or not. The issue is that when we conducted analysis of the science parks throughout the world a number of years ago, we detected that a significant majority of them were more or less in this segment of the axis. Most of them were semi-urban, perhaps slightly inclined towards the non-urban uh, side of things, because many of them some years ago were perhaps not inside the city itself, but rather in the outskirts or very close to the city. But again, as I said before, this urban or non-urban character must not be regarded only from the geographical point of view. It is not only uh, depending on whether park is physically in the city or not. There are many other elements that determine whether a park is urban or non-urban. What we have seen, seen in the last uh, 10 years or so, and it, this is something that seems to be uh, increasing, is that parks nowadays are moving towards this side of the axis, more and more so. Either because the newer parks are already being built within the city, or because older parks, despite not being in the city, are incorporating new urban elements to them. Residential areas, leisure areas, cultural offer, etc. Et uh, you may have noticed that uh, we have recently changed the name of our association. The International Association of Science Parks uh, is now called and Areas of Innovation. And there is a good reason for that, actually. Uh, the, the fact is that we have been uh, witnessing the birth, the creation of an entirely new generation of projects, which on the one hand have a lot of similarities with science and technology parks as traditionally uh, conceived. Many common elements and building blocks and ingredients. On the other hand, however, it is quite evident for anyone that would look at them uh, with uh, sufficient distance that these projects are yet quite different from uh, science and technology parks. So I personally believe that one can legitimately claim that these new projects, again provisionally referred to as areas of innovation, are the offspring of the science and technology park concept but evolved into a new kind of thing. And probably this has a lot to do with the concept of the knowledge worker. We said before that the knowledge economy has created many things. One of them, one of these new things is a new type of worker whose main asset is knowledge rather than any other skill or ability, which is typically a a younger professional, at least yet, because old, uh, young becomes old later on, but so far we can talk about a younger generation of professionals, highly skilled, uh, technologically speaking, uh, but also with, uh, with other type of abilities, uh, speaking languages, or at least more than their ancestors and their, and their fathers, uh, with a global approach uh, not only to economy and to the world, but even to their personal lives. Now, these new people are the most precious asset for any newer company today. And in fact, much more than, than, than any other thing, the main concern of, of uh, knowledge-based companies is to ensure that they have uh, a capacity to attract this new type of, uh, of worker. And more importantly, not only to attract it, but also to retain it, which is becoming probably one of the main challenges that these uh, newer companies have. Uh, and it is precisely in this uh, context that the notion of area of innovation appears. Perhaps the main difference between the newer areas of innovation and the traditional concept of science and technology park has to do with the hybridization uh, issue. These uh, concepts are, of course, spaces conceived for uh, hosting uh, companies and economic activity, but not only that. They have to be attractive to people. 
they have to be attractive to knowledge workers. They have to offer them something more than just a space to work, a space to interact, to communicate, to develop personally, not only professionally, uh, culturally, to be able even sometimes to raise their families, to, to live their lives. So the spaces that we are talking about can no longer be attractive just for companies. They have to be, again, attractive for uh, people. And so areas of innovation all of a sudden becomes something very much related to the newer role of city and the newer protagonism that cities are acquiring in trying to make sure that the knowledge economy roots in their uh, area, in their neighborhoods. Now, how do science parks relate to all that is again a crucial issue that anybody interested in the concept of science park cannot but have very present on their diaries and their agendas on, on everyday ba basis, I would say. Since we uh, decided to open up our full membership category, not only to the traditional science and technology park, but also to this newer uh, idea of areas of innovation, whatever they are, we'll enter into that just uh, in a minute, we've been paying quite a considerable amount of attention to what these newer areas of innovation are. Again, as I said before, they are projects which share a lot of features goals, objectives, building blocks with science and technology parks and yet they are not quite the same. And uh, so far we have spotted four different great categories within these newer areas of innovation. The first category is what we call enhanced neighborhoods and I will be telling you about their features uh, in a minute. A couple of examples of this enhanced neighborhood uh, concept could be Berlin Adlershof in uh, Germany, for example, or 22 Ad in Barcelona, in Spain. A second uh, category would be the upgraded neighborhoods, which is a different issue altogether than the enhanced uh, neighborhoods. Perhaps a very clear example and very pertinent for that matter could be Porto Digital in the city of Recife in Brazil where the ISP uh, has its World Conference in 2013. A third big group of these areas of innovation is a better known concept, let's call it Science City. Again, the features of it, we'll, we'll deal with them in a minute. There are a number of examples emerging all throughout the world. We have the Ciudad del Saber in the city of Panama, for example. We have Amata Science City near uh, Bangkok in Thailand. We have uh, a very new project that is beginning to be in preparation in Oman and uh, a, a number of other ones which are pretty interesting. And last but not least, we have what we could call coordinated areas. Now this is a, a more ambiguous concept, uh, if you like, but it's also a quite interesting issue. Those are, so far, the great types of areas of innovation that we are dealing with at the IASP. What we call enhanced neighborhoods are typically uh, created in already existing areas of a city, or neighborhoods, where you would set up a series of buildings and infrastructures intended to attract a certain type of company, uh, sometimes from various sectors, sometimes from just one sector. So these newer businesses uh, within, the, uh, within the framework of the knowledge economy start to develop uh, their activity in this pre-established urban context. Then a managing body, a managing organization is created to manage all these new facilities, not, not the neighborhood in general, which is still tied to the council, to the city council, but rather the knowledge economy activities that have to take place into that neighborhood. And so there is supposed to, to be an interaction occurring over time between the various agents in the neighborhood, the ones that were already there, the local businesses, the family businesses and so on, 
and the newer type of innovative companies that are going to be attracted. The uh, upgraded neighborhoods is something different. Uh, we call upgraded neighborhoods to those city areas where the concept of Science Park is applied in order to rescue certain areas of cities which have been left to fate. So, uh, typically large urban operations and construction work takes place in order to breathe life, as it were, into these dead or, or decaying areas. Buildings are allocated for business incubation or office space. Programs are designed for neighbors to improve the appearance of their streets and their buildings. There are improved infrastructures. Uh, normally, uh, newer residential areas would be introduced or apartments, older apartments would be renovated to attract a young and capable population. The concept of science city is altogether different. Uh, typically, what we deal with here is with the creation of a whole new area outside a city, although never too far away from one. And so we talk about fairly large spaces where there will be uh, space for work, for living, for lifestyle, for cultural activities, etc. Uh, very often, too, we will see a university or at least university faculties and, or, and research centers in the, the science city. And very often, too, these areas already emerge equipped with their own technology park. And finally, these coordinated areas. Perhaps uh, a few examples that are worth mentioning could be the, uh, the area of Ann Arbor in Michigan, in the US, or also in the US, the Telecom Corridor in Richardson, Texas, for example, which are now uh, getting very close to our association. This is perhaps a more ambiguous concept, at least territorially speaking. It would consist of existing areas, small community, a uh, region, a county, that creates a management team responsible for coordinating the various knowledge economy strategies and knowledge economy programs and agents that may already be present and located in the area. Their objective would be to link policies together to define common strategies. And of course they should have a certain decision-making capacity or a certain authority uh, as it were, to create new elements that may not be in place, such as innovation centers or incubators, etc. Those are somehow the four main categories of these newer innovation areas that we are taking into consideration and that we are willing to incorporate as full members to our association next to the traditional science and technology park. As I said before, the ISP has opened up its membership and now uh, not only the traditional science or technology park can become a full member of the ISP, but also many of these newer areas of innovation can apply and they are actually already applying and becoming members of the ISP. And this, however, posed a newer challenge because there is a very large variety of such areas of innovation and perhaps not all of them fit in an association like ours. So we had to somehow establish requisites to determine which areas of innovation fit in the association, meaning that their presence in the association will produce benefits to the members that are already there and also that it will be meaningful for themselves to join us and which should be perhaps left out. And if I am going to uh, share with you this checklist of requisites, it's not uh, to, uh, to share with you something that is probably just an internal procedure of the association, but simply because by listing them we will probably understand better what are the type of features, provided the parrots here let me uh, speak, that we are seeking in this type of areas of innovation. First of all, areas of innovation willing to join ISP must be legally constituted. They shouldn't be uh, a government organization. They may be owned by governments, but they should be independent. It should be an organization set up specifically to manage the area of innovation. The applicant area must be officially tasked to execute a strategy conducive to growing innovation activity in the area. The applicant must have adequate staffing for their tasks. 
The applicant must be managing or be functionally connected to specific locations, cities in particular, but not only, for example, uh, regions or even counties, that are in any case credible as areas of innovation. They have, they must have a triple helix representation on its governing body. Among its responsibilities and missions, there should be fostering economic activity via innovation, which can be science or technology driven innovation or other types, such as social innovation, for example. It must be, of course, a long term initiative. And finally, they must manage or own one or more innovation mechanism within that area. So what is in all this that we've been talking about today for the traditional science and technology parks that are already existing since a number of years ago? Is there a future for them, even if they may not be very urban, even if they may not be located inside a city? I would say yes, there is a future for them indeed, and this future has to be linked to parks becoming active players within their cities themselves. Probably uh, the trick is to, to make sure that parks can persuade their stakeholders and their city authorities that they can be instrumental in driving their cities towards this new context of the knowledge economy. If knowledge economy is, among many other things, about technology, about innovation and about entrepreneurship, science parks are the professionals for those things. So perhaps the main message is to uh, accept in our own mental frame and then to communicate it to others that parks next to uh, doing their job as they are doing it now within their traditional park boundaries. They can carry out activities, they can lead programs, they can foster processes outside their boundaries. In fact, a number of parks are already managing other projects and facilities within their own cities that are no longer located within uh, the park uh, territory, if I may say it this way. So link yourselves to the city, put a city in your life could be perhaps the message to ensure that science and technology parks are going to be in the future to come as important and as relevant as they have been until now. Thank you very much for your attention and have a great conference.